Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Portimao circuit here in the Algarve region of Portugal, where we've got the qualifying session coming up for this next round, the fifth round of the 2012 FIA GT1 World Championship. My name is Jack Nichols. I'm here in the commentary box overlooking the start finish straight. Hayley Coxon is joining me down in the pit lane, and we've got three qualifying sessions coming up to you, or rather, three sections of qualifying and they will take place in about 20 degree heat. It's not as hot as it has been at the moment for the past couple of days, but it is only nine o'clock local time. Humidity, fairly humid as you can see. A few clouds on the horizon as well, so there is a small chance of rain, but I'm not expecting it to really affect proceedings. There you can see a great example of this Portimao circuit. That's on the run from turns nine down to turn 10. Really, really undulating. You can see that middle sector in particular is all going to be about downforce, about the grip you can get. It's not really as important to have good straight line speed here as it has been at some of the other venues we've visited. You can see the elevation changes. It really is a very dramatic circuit. It's a fantastic circuit to watch from, and hopefully it'll be providing some fantastic racing to watch. As far as the championship is concerned, last time out in the Slovakia ring, if you were with us there, you'll have seen Jelma Berman and Michael Bartels win the championship race, and they, as a result, move to the top of the drivers' championship standings. But they've only got a six-point advantage over Steph Dusseldorp and Fred Makovicki. You can see there in second position. Fred Makovicki, with his results last time out in the Slovakia ring, became the highest-ever point-scoring driver in FIA GT1 and uh, in the FIA GT1 World Championship, I should say, specifically since 2010, overtaking Darren Turner. Mark Basseng and Marcus Vingelhock lie third place in the championship despite not winning a race yet so far this season. And uh, in fact, they, uh, the, the Mercedes are the only brand in that top six you can see there not to win a race, but it hasn't stopped them in their charge for the team's championship. Alinkle.com, Munich Motorsports with their Mercedes are top of the championship ahead of Hexis Racing in second. Belgian Audi Club Team WRT have struggled really since that opening weekend in Nagaro where they were so dominant. Vita for One Racing Team now up into fourth place with their strong performance from Berman and Bartels last time out. AF Corsa fifth in the championship, Exim Bank Team China in sixth and Writer Engineering in seventh. So two minutes to go before this qualifying session gets underway. Now, unfortunately, the uh, number eight Porsche of Benjamin Narish and Dino Lenardi, you may remember it had uh, mechanical problems with its engine last time out in Slovakia ring. They replaced the engine, put a new one in, but they've also encountered problems so far today. So it's uh, or so far this weekend, I should say. And so I don't think they're going to be running in this qualifying session, which is a, a real shame. Uh, as Dino Lenardi, uh, in particular, has shown a lot of pace when he's deputized for uh, the uh, still ill Renway over the past couple of rounds, and Benjamin Larish too, has started to get the hang of the Porsche, having moved over from single-seaters that he's been campaigning in the last couple of years. Last year he was in FIA Formula 2, for example. There you can see the, the mountainous, uh, well, not quite mountainous, but certainly very undulating region we're in here at Portimao. And there you can see those clouds I was talking about. It's been absolutely clear blue sky for the past couple of days, but a few clouds creeping in here and there. So this first qualifying session, we usually uh, eliminate the drivers slower than 15th position, but unfortunately, because we don't think the Porsche will be taking the qualifying session, it means that all the cars will have to complete one timed lap, and they will then, uh, in effect, make it through to the second session because of how uh, the Porsche's reliability problems have developed. And you can see a cool little heat haze. I think that's on the exit of uh, turn five going up the hill. And there's the main grandstand here at this circuit that was open back in 2008. And it's seen a fair amount of racing since then, really. Uh, World Touring Cars were here earlier this year. Uh, the Le Mans Series comes here regularly as well. The FIA GT1 World Championship has been coming here since 2010. And so it, it, it certainly is a circuit that the drivers seem to enjoy and it, it, they really seem to relish the prospect of driving around this circuit. There's the number one car then of Hexis. That's Steph Dusseldorp, you can see in the uh, fireproof overalls just to the left there. He's going to be in the car for the second segment of qualifying. It's Fred Makovicki who will be starting the car in the qualifying session. You can hear the engines getting revved up down in the pit lane. That's because the light has gone green. So, as a result, the cars are heading out onto the circuit. First man out is going to be Mike Parisi in the Exim Bank 
Team China Porsche. And Mike is currently lying uh, down in eighth place in the championship. He's usually partnered with Matt Halliday, but unfortunately this weekend, Matt Halliday not here. And so it's going to be Andreas Zuber alongside Mike in that car. Although Andreas Zuber has uh, been fairly quick. He was out in the Porsche last time, you may remember in Slovakia, in partnering Benjamin Larif. So Zuba's been doing the rounds somewhat <laughs> this season so far in GT1, but uh, he's enjoying getting to grips with uh, a different car each weekend, he was telling me. So here's another new one for him, although it is, of course, just the sister car. So Mike Parisi, who won the championship race at Zolda with his teammate Matt Halliday, that moved them up into second place in the championship, but since then, he and Halliday have struggled just a little bit. They didn't pick up any points at all in Navarra, and then only put, picked up six from uh, what, is a, what, what is a possible 33. Um, the last time we were all together at the Slovakia ring. There's the number four air Corsa car. Enzo Eid is going to be having the first go in that machine. So he's uh, saying a little hello. And of course, so this basically means that these drivers out there, they are going to be the ones who are going to compete for pole position because the first segment, once the first segment is done with, then the second session will decide the top eight that will go through to the final shootout for pole position. And here you can see the uh, slow right-hander up at uh, turn 11. Tony Verlander, he's going to be piloting the number three AF Corsa Ferrari. And they picked up their first win in GT1 at Slovakia Ring. Well, it was, only the, it was only the qualifying race win, but nevertheless, it was still an impressive drive. It featured a fantastic move from Belanda around the outside of two cars up at the first corner. So here's Mike Parisi then setting his uh, qualifying lap. It'll be interesting to see how hard he was pushing times-wise. I'm expecting pole position to be in the 1 minute 44s because uh, the quickest time we had was Tony Belanda in the free practice one yesterday morning. A woman at 44.508. So uh, they might be able to shave a couple of tenths of a second off that, but I doubt we're going to see them challenging the 43s, but I'm more than happy to be proved wrong. So 44.45 is a decent time around here in FIA GT1. So as I say, it'll be interesting to see how hard these guys push because this is in effect acting as a bit of a shakedown for them. It'll be the first time they've driven the car since yesterday afternoon, and uh, they will be, as I say, hopefully in their eyes competing for pole position so perhaps they will take it a little bit seriously and try and get some decent running in try and get to grips with the circuit how it's performing this morning because the final qualifying session is only 10 minutes long so that's only going to give you a couple of hot laps Parisi sweeping up the long left hander of turn 13 which immediately moves into turn 14 and then turn 15 which is a very one of the most clumsy corners on the circuit. It, the car really understeers through there, but then you accelerate out of 15 and down through from the worst corner on the circuit, potentially, to the best corner. It's uh, almost flat out, this last final corner at turn 16, and it's the, it's the elevation changes that really make it a challenge. The, the circuit drops away from you, and then just as the car has gone light, the compression comes again, and it comes back to you. 46.1 for Mike Parisi and that uh, in actual fact is comfortably their fastest time of the weekend so that's a bit of an interesting one they completed 26 laps yesterday uh, and the best they well 30 laps in total yesterday and the best they managed was a 47-0 so that's encouraging for Mike Parisi as the McLaren makes its way down into uh, turn four this right hander where I think we're going to see a lot of action in the opening laps of the race turn two here is a bit of an enigma um, because you have turn one, then you have the little kink afterwards, which is actually um, technically by the FIA recognized as turn three. So I'm not really sure where turn two is. It's kind of disappeared off the official circuit map. So that's why if you're, if you're counting along the corners with me and you think I've missed one out, that's the, that's the reason. This is the turn six hairpin down here where we could see a bit of action under braking. Albert von Turn and Taxis is also going to be out in FIA GT3 as well this weekend, driving a uh, Chevrolet Camaro with Ryder Engineering, which it'll be great to see the Camaro finally make its GT3 debut. It tried to at Zolder, but had a few 
technical problems, so that's certainly a reason to tune in for the FIA GT3 race. Stefano Telli sets his obviously personal best sector one, but it's a 32.5, which is nowhere near being spectacular. So Stefan obviously taking the opinion to just cruise around. We saw him have a massive moment at Slovakia in qualifying, you may remember. He skidded off at uh, turn nine, speared back across the circuit and managed to somehow hit nothing at all and just get a bit of gravel in the car. So a miraculous save from Ortelli, uh, a 33-5 middle sector. That's not too bad. So he's, he's, he's not cruising and he's not just cruising around to get a lap under his belt. Here we go then on board through this fantastic final corner and then down the start finish straight a little bit of a break up there unfortunately just as he comes through the the uh, the exciting final corner but he's now right up behind that mclaren of gregoire de moustier so as things stand uh matthias lauder has just come across the line to set the fastest time so far a 45.7 so still a, a decent time nothing Nothing too spectacular, as we say, but we weren't really expecting that in a session where they, uh, they, in effect, just need to complete the lap in order to qualify for the second segment. It's going to be that 15-minute second segment that's possibly going to be one of the most exciting and one of the most difficult to keep track of that we've got coming up today. There's Marc Basseng in the 38 car. He was but half an hour ago driving me around this circuit in the Mercedes... AMG SLS leading car and uh, he was surprised at how how noticeably it was the same car but how much quicker the GT1 car was he said it was almost um, it was a very different machine to drive but he could still feel the fundamental basics of the car playing out in a similar fashion which was quite interesting Tony Volander then quickest man so far this weekend starts a lap and well, this is actually going to be his in-lap, I think, because he's just on a 44.9 to move him to the top of the timing screen. So, Tony Belanda, only four-tenths of a second slower than he managed yesterday. Car 33, which is Frank Stippler, is being advised to respect the track limits. There's a few places around this circuit, actually, where track limits might become a factor at some point. On the exit of Turn 5, you can run very wide. On the exit of the final corner as well, here's Turn 5. Look. And, uh, well, yeah, that was all four wheels over the white line, technically, from Mark Bassang. He's still had two wheels on the kerb, though, so he might just get away with uh, those kind of lines. He's going to uh, miss the apex quite spectacularly down there at turn six, pushing the limits of that Mercedes. He's not just cruising around. He's done a 32-2 in sector one, which is uh, pretty decent. And Bassang fairly positive this weekend because he, the normal problem with the... Mercedes is the straight line speed. There's his teammate Marcus Winkelhock on the left, Thomas Jaeger on the right. Um, yeah, the normal problem with the straight line speed of the Mercedes, he says, isn't so much of a problem around Portimao, and he thinks the car is going to be very strong through the final corner on the circuit, which he will be arriving at in a few moments' time. As he climbs up through 13, which tightens into 14. Very difficult to get the braking right. And then said before through this long right-hander at 15 going uh, not really quite getting the car into the apex and then almost flat out through this final turn 16 corner where the car goes light about here and then it plants back down again and it's very very easy to, to run out wide the same keeping it all together he's done personal bests so far and his first flying lap is going to be a 46.8 so not particularly spectacular we saw a couple of mistakes uh, most notably the very very wide apex at turn six but that will be enough to get him through Matteo Crisoni running wide on the exit of the final corner and up across the line he comes this is going to be a one minute 46.1 to put him currently in eighth position that Ford GT still hasn't picked up any points this season which seems rather bizarre considering they they've led the race at um, Navarra they've been battling over second place in the race at Slovakia in last time. So it is a bit bizarre to think that they haven't actually managed to notch any points on the board. They'll be hoping that changes here. And uh, that's the problem with Al Inkel. They all talk in German. So when we listen in like that, it's very interesting. But uh, I can't really tell you what they're saying because 
My German isn't particularly strong. Enzo E does a personal best in sector one, 32.365. Sector two begins uh, just here. And, well, sector two ends, I should say, just here. And a 33.6 for him in the middle sector, which is uh, a fair attempt. Enzo will be hoping his teammate Francesco Castellacci can take him through to the final segment of qualifying. The Ferraris are looking strong this weekend and a little bit of opposite lock coming out of turn 15 then through 16 he comes. The Ferraris very kind on their tyres we're hearing uh, around the paddock that's their, their main concern because tyre drop off seems to be a bigger issue here than it has been so far this season. Once the tyres do go off that cliff they're then stable it's not like in Formula One where the tires will go off the cliff um, and then become completely unusable and you have to pit for fresh ones these guys these tires will just give you a few laps of peak performance and then fall off and just give you consistent performance after that but they're finding here at Portimao certainly the BMWs were anyway that 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 peak window is literally one lap maybe not even that you're coming to turn 16 and you're already feeling the tires start to go so it's a real challenge for these guys with tire management especially with a half hour race coming up later on and also how you heat the tires through through your outlap in qualifying is going to be one of the interesting things to watch out for especially when we get into this second qualifying session and then of course the final pole position shootout. Enzo Eid goes fastest of anyone then in sector one. That's pretty impressive from the young Belgian driver. He's uh, gone way over the inside there and he's lost as a result uh, a reasonable amount of time. I think he's three tenths of a second down on his second sector time from his previous lap. But this is looking like it could be some decent pace for the number four Ferrari, which so far uh, has only picked up 12 points. Had a ninth place finish at the last round in Slovakia ring during the championship race and also finished in the top five in the opening championship race in Nagaro. But apart from that, Enzo Eid and Francesco Castellacci yet to have any more point scoring finishes. Across the line he comes to do a 45.8 to put him in seventh position. So looking strong in sector one and Eid and Castellacci will be hoping they can find a little bit more pace in the remaining two sectors here's Albert von Turn and Taxis then this weekend partnered by Stefan Rossina in the writer engineering Lamborghini von Turn and Taxis who's he's been impressing people with his pace especially last time out at Slovakia ring despite not well he missed all of free practice because of a, a gearbox problem I think it was that the Lamborghinis had there's Darrell Young. Obviously not particularly happy with some traffic issues or something like that. He's already uh, strapped in, but I wouldn't be surprised if he's going to unstrap himself before too long. So we've got six minutes of this session remaining, and he's set a decent lap time, actually, of 45.6. He and his teammate Peter Cox were quickest in the second free practice session yesterday they picked up a 45.8 Peter Cox did that 45.8 but Darrell Young managed a 45.9 as well so those two pretty evenly matched in that rider engineering Lamborghini Frank Stippler out of the hairpin and he is currently down in 11th position so we've got a decent spread of brands in fact we've got six brands in the top six so once again the, the balance of performance which uh, sorry five brands in the top five I should say because Matthias Lauda is there in sixth place so I'll give you a rundown of, of how it's going at the moment there you can see Ferrari on top BMW in second Mercedes in third then we've got Lamborghini in fourth Audi in fifth and then the second BMW of Matthias Lauda and Nicky Mayer-Manhoff currently in sixth position these times of course don't uh, particularly mean anything but they're giving us a good indication of who has pace because I don't think come the qualifying shootout or the next session the pole position shootout I should say or the next session I don't think it's going to be particularly different there you can see the uh, the effects of the 
non-front-engined Ferrari. Nice little space in under the bonnet. Good work going on here on the right rear. See, uh, see, difficult to quite make out exactly what was going on. Didn't seem to be too concerned about uh, about proceedings. McLaren struggling a little bit at the moment in this first session, of course. As I say, the first session doesn't really mean anything today, unfortunately. But let's hear from Tony Volander. He's quickest in this session. He's down in the pit lane with Hayley Coxer. Tony, you've been quickest so far this weekend. Can you turn it into a good qualifying and a good result after the races this weekend? Yeah, we're now P1 after Q1. Uh, we, I had a small issue with the brakes. Uh, the guys are now bleeding it, and uh, hopefully we can find some air and solve the problem. Uh, now it's up to Philip the Q2, and then hopefully we have a good run in Q3. So let's hope for the best. Is that the advantage you've been racing here rather a few times before this weekend? Yeah, I, I love this racetrack. I mean, earlier this year in GT Open, I did the pole uh, with the GT2 car. Uh, in the past, in uh, LMS, uh, I had good results. So maybe it suits my driving style. I don't know. Uh, and, and I really like the ups and downs and and the demanding corners, especially like the the last turn, which is fourth, fifth gear really, really takes a breath out of you. So. Thank you. When Tony Volander raced here earlier this year in the uh, GT Open Series, and it was, it was raining for much of the weekend, so he probably doesn't have quite as much experience running in these dry conditions. There you can see Frank Stippler, he's been given warnings for uh, exceeding track limits, and he's certainly pushing those track limits, and he's certainly stayed out there for longer than anyone else he's about to come across the line now to complete his eighth lap of the session he does a uh, 46.6 which leaves him in 11th place but he's done eight laps in this session and his teammate Stefano Telli has done seven everyone else has done three or four really apart from Albert Von Turn and Taxis but the majority of drivers have done three or four but Stippler and Ortelli doing eight and seven respectively so that's a uh, it's fairly interesting. Audi's clearly still not happy with how their pace is. There you can see a Pirelli representative just having a look at some of the Ferrari tyres. Stippler under braking them for the hairpin. And he climbs the hill. Through a little kink at turn seven and then eight, which effectively becomes a kind of braking zone for nine. You throw it in, start to get on the brakes and then make sure the car is completely slowed down by the time you get to turn nine, up the hill, where the torque of the engine is going to be very important to drive you up that hill. Over the crest, you can feel the drop as you fly over that crest, and then you really take a tight line through this right-hander at, uh, at turn 11 to give you the best line into turn 12. A minute and 20 seconds remaining on the clock. There's the teammate car of Stefano Telly. He's going to be handing over to Lawrence Van Thor before too long. There is Zortelli in the back of the garage, helmet off, chatting to the engineers. And not looking particularly satisfied, although he's managed to put in the fifth best qualifying time. Here's Frank Stippler flying out of the final corner. And across the line he comes. Can he improve on his uh, 1 minute 46.3 across the line? And no, he cannot. 1 minute 46.7 on that last lap so Stippler struggling just a little bit so uh, well we've got some news on Audi from uh, Hayley Cox and down in the pit lane Hayley yeah hey Jack update and car 33 Frank Stippler's chose to do more laps due to the fact they've changed a few things on the setup of the car so they're purely testing it okay so uh, the the Audi's just struggling a little bit. Who, who Haley, do you think is looking in the best shape here this weekend? I mean, certainly the Ferraris seem to be b being pretty kind on their tyres, but I think the BMWs might be dark horses. Uh, definitely BMWs, and I do believe that Al Inkle will walk away with the, some healthy points this weekend. OK, well, Al Inkle then certainly wants to watch out for. Thank you, Haley. Mark Basseng, third place in that qualifying session. Six-tenths slower than the Ferrari of Tony Volander, but... Uh, but of course, in this first session, it doesn't really mean much. There's Michael Bartels. He's all strapped in, ready to go out for the second qualifying session. And so for this second session, the top eight will make it through. So that means we will lose six cars 
from this next session in the elimination format that you've seen uh, often in Formula One and it really has provided some pretty exciting qualifying sessions so far as everyone desperately tries to be in that top eight and also battles for positions further down. McLarens, we haven't mentioned them actually. They might be in a little bit of trouble, you know, this weekend because they're currently 9th and 14th in that first segment of qualifying. So whether Makovicki was sandbagging perhaps or just uh, taking it easy, not wanting to stress the what is a very sensitive and temperamental McLaren too hard in, in the first free practice session well their quickest times in free practice came from Alvaro Parent and Fred Makovicki who both did a 46-0 and Fred Makovicki once again has done a 46-0 so I would suggest there is more time to come from, from that McLaren but whether it can get into the 44s where I think pole position will be I'm, uh, I'm not entirely sure even though you would have thought this would be a decent McLaren venue. Let's have a look at the Al Inkel Mercedes Benz. And there you can see the 38 car. That is Mark Basseng and Marcus Winkelhock's machine, the V8 engine, one of the best sounding out there. It really is fantastic. 500 brake horsepower, 600 newton meters of torque. The longest car out there as well, 4.7 meters long. And there you can see the two drivers, Mark Basseng who uh, has been a pretty successful driver in his time, Marcus Winkelhock as well. You may remember had a brief flirtation with Formula One when he drove for the Spiker team at the Rain Affected 2007 European Grand Prix at the Nürburgring and ended up leading after a little bit of cunning tyre strategy. And so that is the 38 car, their teammates, Nicky Pastorelli and Thomas Jaeger. Also struggling just a little bit in that session. A 47.3 was the best they could do. And, well, we expect a little bit more from uh, Nicky Pastorelli and Thomas Jaeger, it's probably fair to say. Nicky Pastorelli, who has competed in every single round of the FIA GT1 World Championship. He's been here for, uh, for an awful long time. Let's hear from uh, Bernard Mulner then. He is the boss of Bern uh, Mulner Motorsports, who run the Porsches. He's with Haley. Bernard, sadly, the number eight car won't make it out this weekend. What's been the issue? We have had a new engine in the car and it blew up on Friday. And so, um, yeah, we have to, uh, we can't run this weekend. Thank you. Yep, put the engine in, the new engine after Slovakia, as I mentioned earlier. If it blows up, it blows up. It's, uh, it's very, very unfortunate for the well, for the, for, the, for the race, really, because Dino Lenardi in that car is also always going to be pretty entertaining to watch. Benjamin Larish as well, starting to get to grips with the Porsche. Mike Parisi was our first man out in this qualifying session, and he, in the end, did a decent job, quick enough for eighth place. Ferraris were battling hard as well, but uh, the 32 car of Stefano Telli stayed out for a long time. Both of the Audis did. In fact, trying to get to grips with their car just a little bit. Mark Basseng we saw pushing very, very hard. And he went very wide down there at turn six. Missed his breaking point in a few other places as well as he tried to extract the maximum from the car. Fantastic shot there of the final corner. It'll get more spectacular later in the day when the sun comes over a little bit because at the moment that final corner is still in a little bit of shade. The quickest man then in that session, though, was the three car of Tony Valanda. Ferrari's looking very strong. Frank Stippler stayed out for a long time to continue persevering with that WRT Audi. But despite a few brake problems, Tony Valanda was the quickest man in that session. They had to bleed the, the right rear, as you can see them there. Hopefully that problem will be fixed for Philippe Salaquada, who will be heading out next in a few moments time Oliver Jarvis all strapped in in the 33 Audi looking very focused as he knows what he has to do he has to wrestle that car into the top eight a position where it wasn't in the first qualifying session down there in 11th place so it's going to be quite a quite a challenge for Oliver Jarvis and he will be hoping to find some of that pace that they just lost after Nagaro because Nagaro was very very a strong weekend for them perhaps it was a, a case of being better prepared than anyone else the WRT Audi squad and the Belgian Audi club who uh, who run it 
very, very well prepared for Nagaro. Some of the cars uh, were, you know, last minute uh, additions to the championship or last minute that they managed to get it all sorted. It was, uh, so it was a very difficult for the Audis. So Haley's down in the pit lane. Haley. Yeah, just thinking about who may go out in this session, Jack. I don't know what your views are on that, but I'm not too sure about the other Porsche. I know it's been struggling with time so far in pre-practice. What do you think? Yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting. I mean, Mike Parisi on that first segment of qualifying, he set the fastest lap that they've managed all weekend. But whether uh, Andres Zuber can go any quicker than that, we'll have to wait and see. I think the McLarens, though, could be in a little bit of trouble. They've been, they've been very, very quiet this weekend. They have, they have, and they're certainly wanting to take some more points because obviously they're sat in second in the team's championship at the moment. It would be great for them to take the lead, but I really don't think they will do that here in Portimao this weekend. No, so uh, Haley's not particularly positive about the McLaren's uh, weekend coming up, and I, and I have to say I agree with her a little bit. Looking at the free practice times and that first qualifying session, the, their quickest driver, arguably, is going to be in this next session, Alvaro Parent. He is... A Portuguese driver, so he's at his home circuit, and he's going to be very much looking forward to, to getting out there. He, he and Makovicki have been the two quickest drivers for McLaren, and I would, I would almost go as far as to say Parent has been the quickest driver for McLaren. It, McLaren, as a, uh, as a company, have been massively impressed with Alvaro Parent. He was a large part in the development of the MP412C. So he's held in very high esteem at Woking. So as a result, they, they did the deal with Hexis and were delighted to get Alvaro Parent in there on board to continue the development of this car as well because there's a very good working relationship between Hexis and McLaren. And it's, it's Hexis, really, that are leading the development of this MP412C, which is, of course, a car that's, that's in its first full season of... Uh, of international competition it had a few flirtations last year heading out in the Blanc Pan endurance series for a couple of races that it ultimately didn't finish I don't think especially at Silverstone uh, Alvaro Perrin had a few technical problems which meant he didn't complete the race but Hexis and McLaren appear to be getting closer and closer by the weekend there is Alvaro Perrin's car hopefully they're just checking everything's okay there's not uh, too many issues in there he will be heading out in a few moments time so this is a session after the um, non-event, really, of Q1, this is the session where things are going to happen in Q2. Thomas Jaeger out there in the 37, Al Inkel beat uh, Mercedes. So I'll remind you once again, the top eight from this session will make it through to the final pole position shootout. And so we will lose six cars. There's Enzo Ede. He's hoping to be in that pole position shootout depending, depending on what his teammate Francesco Castellacci can do. So I think it's going to be the, uh, the car of Thomas Jaeger who will be the first man across the line. Then we've got Nicky Mayer Melnhoff out there in the 17 car. He was, well, he was the, the man that was uh, telling me about those problems with the tyre drop-off that BMW are struggling with just a little bit. Perhaps they sorted it out for the second Free practice session here's that fantastic shot down through turn 16 is his teammate Michael Bartels teammate and boss across the line then and uh, let's go down then into turn one you'll see on the brakes it dips down and then it comes back up just at the last moment and then you have to throw it into the right hander try not to hit that sausage curb on the inside line because that'll rip your front splitter straight off then down into turn four possibly the tightest corner on the circuit wide line in to try and get as much speed out as possible flat through here pretty much flat through there for Michael Bartels then down into the hairpin at turn 6 get it turned in nice and early and you can really see the elevation changes the onboard cameras do a fantastic job of showing it, it still doesn't quite do it justice but then we've got this right hander at eight which leads into nine little squirt of the tiniest squirt of power before going into the right hander at nine and then up the hill we come another blind crest little kink at ten and then look at this line through eleven straight in through the apex in order it's all about twelve eleven is a non-corner it's all about getting the line in for twelve 
Then up the hill through 13, which leads into 14. Another blind corner until very, very late in the day. You can see the sun glaring into their driver's eyes. And then this kind of clumsy turn 15. And then here we go. Let's ride with Bartels through this final corner. Is he going to be able to keep it flat in this qualifying session in the BMW Z4? Little lift. And then finally back on the power. That's quite interesting because he lifted and didn't come back on the power until he was well over the crest. So Bartels comes across the line to do a 46.5. So not a, uh, he wasn't massively on it, I don't think, that time around from Bartels. I'm certainly expecting him to be in the 45s, challenging the 44s. So that was probably just a bit of a banker lap, but great to see those onboard pictures. Hopefully, if you've never seen a race here at the Portimao circuit, that's giving you a bit of a better idea of where it goes. Marcus Vingelhock has just set the fastest first sector of anyone, a 31.933. So we'll see how much he can close that time down. Alvaro Perrin is out there, you can see, which is good news. There were no dramas for that McLaren. It's a very bumpy circuit as well here at Portimao. It's, uh, as I say, opened in 2008, and since then, Quite a few bumps have developed, especially down the main start finish straight. I haven't, I haven't actually asked the drivers about it because in in single seaters, drivers were getting headaches down this start finish straight because it was so bumpy. GT cars, whilst they're whilst they're still very very stiff suspension to machines, they don't quite have the bum on the floor layout of a single seater. You can see through the final corner comes Alvaro Parent down the start finish straight. But yeah, single seater drivers were getting headaches due to the nature of this start finish straight. It's probably less dramatic as Alvaro Parent whizzes past the commentary box to do a 1 minute 45.2. Quickest lap of the session so far. Probably quick enough to get him into the second qualify to the final qualifying session. There's his teammate Gregoire de Moussier, the youngest driver out there. Struggled a little bit in that first session. We sorted it out in sector two. This is going to be a good lap, I think, from Francesco Castellacci. Across the line he comes to do a 1 minute 44.8. So that number four Ferrari is looking quick this weekend. In the hands of Francesco. Who have we got now then? We've got Peter Cox in the number 25 car, the Lamborghini Gallardo. Quickest man in second practice yesterday. The Lamborghinis looking like they should be strong around here because it's a fairly similar circuit to, uh, to the likes of Navarra. A bit more undulation than Navarra, but in general, this flowing, twisty corners where we saw the Lamborghinis and the McLarens perform so strongly, you'd think it would play into their hands again. So Peter Cox has done nothing spectacular in the first couple of sectors. 31.8 is uh, decent couple of tenths down in the middle sector so this is going to give him a low 45 Peter Cox which will possibly be enough to get him through into the next segment of qualifying it's a 45.068 Darren Lowe Young seems pretty satisfied with that uh, and in fact that was comfortably their quickest lap time of the weekend so far on board we go with Marcus Wingerhock through this final corner he's done uh, he's done a decent time as well, actually. This is going to be a low 45 for Winkelhock as well, because the Mercedes is strong through that final corner. It's a 44.7, in fact. The Mercedes is very strong through that final corner. Fantastic final sector from Marcus Winkelhock, and he moves to provisionally quickest, and we'll stay on board with him as he comes through turn four now. The engine note really dropping in the Mercedes, a very, very deep sound oh, a little bit of oversteer you could just see the back end starting to step out as he tried to take that left hander flat out and then late on the well you've got to be early on the brakes earlier than you would be because it's downhill once again it's a late apex down there at the hairpin to give you the best drive out flat through this left hand kink yep comfortably oh the back end really going there for Winkelhock he is pushing hard he's done his personal best in sector one, a 31.829, which is only two thousandths of a second slower than the quickest 
sector one of anyone, which was Francesco Castellacci. So Finkelhock pushing to go even quicker here. Car 33 is under investigation for not respecting the track limits. So that's Oliver Jarvis. I don't know whether that's when he was, uh, when the car was out in the hands of Frank Stippler. Peter Cox comes across the line and he's going to do a 44.9. That moves him up into third position. So he's the fastest uh, middle sector of anyone on that lap. We go back on board with Marcus Winkelhock. How's his uh, middle sector panned out? Not very well at all. He's a second off as he comes through the final corner. He'll pit. So that's it for Marcus Winkelhock possibly in this session. That 44.793 has him at the top of the times and really should guarantee him passage through. So at the moment we've got um, Winkelhock's Mercedes, Castellacci's Ferrari, Peter Cox's Lamborghini, Alvaro Parent's McLaren, Oliver Jarvis's Audi, Stefan Racina's Lamborghini, Milos Pavlovich's Ford, and Lawrence Van Thor's Audi. They're our top eight that, if the session were to end now, would go through. So only Audi would get two cars into the top eight shootout, which would be pretty impressive from their point of view. On board we go then with Andres Zuba. How's he doing? A 47-1, so... Oh, look at that understeer through that final corner. Really struggling to get the power on is Andres Zuba. Across the line he comes. And this is going to be a 46.5, so that's an improvement. But it still leaves him in 12th position. Bernard Mourner not looking particularly delighted with that time. Nicky Man Mount up across the line. He's down in 11th place at the moment. Needs to get a couple of tenths of a second if he wants to move up. He's up into 10th place now, 46.136. Across the line comes Thomas Jaeger, and he jumps up into 6th place. So now Mercedes are the two cars, uh, are the team with two cars in the top eight. Four and a half minutes to go in this session. So at the moment, Laurence Van Thor, Philippe Salacuada needs to find some pace. He's 10th at the moment, and that would be a real surprise if the number three Ferrari didn't make it through. Also, neither of the BMWs are through. They're in 11th and 12th place at the moment. And Steph Dusseldorf is down in 14th in the McLaren. So, well, we're watching him now. He's done a personal best in sector one, 32.5. Middle sector is a 33.6. Those aren't particularly impressive times from Steph. So, hopefully this will uh, improve him a little bit. And then he can go out uh, on this next lap and really put a decent time in because at the moment we've got quite a few what I would class as shocks there. Championship leaders in 12th place. Makovicki and Dusseldorf second in the championship. They're in 14th place. Dusseldorf, this should move him up a couple of positions. I would say this could be a 45 for Dusseldorf. Across the line he comes. It's going to be 46-1. Doesn't quite make it into the 45s. It's only good enough for 13th place. Here comes Philippe Salacuada out on the final corner. Can he get that air, of course, of Ferrari into the top eight? Across the line he comes. And no, he can't. So he does a... That must have been his outlap, because it was a 324.134. So that must have been the outlap for Salacuada. So they're leaving it late. Castellacci's happy. He's in the garage with second place. Enzo Eid beside him, his teammate looking pretty happy, but... I can't imagine if we saw Tony Verlander's face in the Ferrari garage that he'd be looking particularly satisfied. Across the line he comes then, 31.835, the pole position, first sector time. It's a 32-1, so three tenths down already. So it's not going to be a quality lap from Salacuada. He's not going to challenge the top three, but if he can stay within a second, he should be able to get through into the top eight. So definitely want to watch the, the pressure for Salacuada is that his teammate Francesco Castellacci a man with much less racing experience it has to be said than Philippe Salacuada is, is currently in second with a 44.8 so that's Salacuada's trouble is that their proof is there that the Ferrari 458 can set competitive lap times it's a decent middle sector 33.5 so he's currently about eight tenths of a second down. So he will get one more shot at this. Out of the final corner 
he will come in a minute so across if this isn't good enough he will get one more chance but with the tire drop off we've been talking about will he have the tire life to do it so Salaquada across the line is this going to get him into the top eight 44.793 for Winkelhock. He's not going to be close to challenging that. Where's this going to move him up to? Seventh place for Salaquada. A good final sector. And you could see them punching the air on the Ferrari pit wall. Tony Belanda must be pretty relieved. But there's still cars out there that can cause um, Salaquada's delight to be short-lived. Because here comes Michael Bartels, currently in 11th place. He wants to be in that top eight shootout more than anything. They're currently leading the championship. Can Bartels haul them into the top eight? 11th. 11th for the championship leaders they've still got one more lap though so Bartels is going to absolutely hurl it around this final lap I'd imagine he's got to find how much time three tenths of a second it's so close in that pack fifth place Thomas Jaeger has done a 45.4 11th place Bartels has done a 45.8 across the line comes Lawrence Van Thor. that's only good enough for 10th place here comes the number one car of Steph Dusseldorf how's this looking it's poor it's poor the number one mclaren isn't going to be in the top 10 shootout the number one mclaren is going to start the race in 12th position the qualifying race that is in 12th position because i think he'll come into the pits i don't think this lap is even worth completing so steph dusseldorp out of the final corner and will he just hug the inside line there's philippe dumas team boss and, uh, well, Dusseldorf is going to stay out, but I don't think this is going to be an improvement. 45.9 is his best so far, and it's a 46.199. So, the number one McLaren of Steph Dusseldorf and Fred Makovicki, second place in the championship, does not make it through to the final top eight shootout. Michael Bartels, has, his tyres have gone. The BMW has run out of tyre life and our championship leaders are not going to be in the top eight shootout either. They're going to be in 11th position. Well, an awful lot of unexpected results in that qualifying session. On board with Bartels, he's done a 45.8. The checker flag is out. 46.0 is all he can manage. So that means that Marcus Winkelhock is quickest in that session. He goes through to the top eight shootout. Francesco Castellacci in the number four Ferrari joins him. Peter Cox in third in his Lamborghini. Lawrence Van Thor has one more shot. Needs to find two tenths of a second, but he dives into the pits. Fastest lap of car 33 will be deleted for exceeding track limits. Now, that's interesting, actually, because that's Oliver Jarvis. So will that time be deleted, I presume, from this qualifying session? Milos Pavlovich having to fifth place. Good lap from him. That Ford GT looking strong once more. So Oliver Jarvis will have his fastest lap time deleted. There it goes. Fortunately for him, his second fastest lap was pretty much identical, only a couple of hundred slower. So that doesn't actually change much. So Parente in the number two McLaren is through as well in fourth place. Milos Pavlovich we just saw in the Ford GT. Fifth place. Sixth place for Thomas Jaeger in the 37 um, Mercedes. Seventh place for the number 33. Oliver Jarvis, Audi, and eighth place, the number three car of Philippe Salaquada. He'll hand over to Tony Belanda. So that car is a real shot for pole position. Salaquada couldn't quite get it all figured out. That means the cars we lose and their subsequent positions for the qualifying race this afternoon will be ninth place, Stefan Racina's Lamborghini. Tenth place, Lawrence Van Thor in the Audi. Eleventh place, Michael Bartels in the BMW. Twelfth place. Steph Dusseldorf in the McLaren. 13th place, Nicky Mayer Melnoff. There you can see him pulling into the pits. And 14th place, the number nine Porsche of Andreas Zuber. Well, what a surprising qualifying session that was. Some of the cars we didn't expect to see up there. Possibly Francesco Castellacci and Enzo Eats, second place in that qualifying session. Certainly their best performance of the season so far in that second segment. Interesting to see what kind of lap time they can pull out in the final session. Let's hear from Fred Makovicki, in fact. His teammate unable to make it through to the pole position shootout. He's down with Haley. 
Frankfurt, obviously not the qualifying session you hoped for. What went wrong? Yeah, it shows that we lose time yesterday uh, during the second free practice because uh, with a little problem on the car, we didn't do the session. And that's why we, we didn't finish really the setup of the car. And uh, bon, we are confident for the race because we know that the car is really good for uh, during the race. Why are you losing pace? Uh, bon, uh, I think so, the balance. We, we must improve a little bit more the, the balance of the car. For this moment, the car is a little bit nervous and uh, we must find some solution. Thank you. So, Fred Makovicki. Still confident for the race then. And Steph not particularly happy with that, is he? You can see the tall chap there is Steph Dusseldorp. And these are the not qualified cars then. The Lamborghini, Audi, BMW, both BMWs eliminated. And there is the sorry sight of the BMW being pushed back into the pit lane. And Michael Bartels, I don't think, will be particularly delighted with how this uh, this qualifying session has transpired so far the Exim Bank Team China car of Andreas Zuber the last qualifier down there in 14th place of 46.5 Mike Parisi managed to pull out a 46 point uh, he managed a 45.9 in fact in the first qualifying session segment but his teammate Andreas Zuber unable to repeat it is the qualification results then of that second segment. These top eight drivers will go through to the final 10 minute shootout for pole position, which will decide the grid for the qualifying race that will come up later today. And then the championship race that we will have tomorrow. And that's where the main points are up for grabs. The qualifying race, uh, just for your information, later today will get underway at quarter past one local time. The local time here is GMT plus one, so the same as the UK, and uh, an hour behind most of Central Europe. So, real trouble for the BMWs. Michael Bartels pushed as hard as he could, but he couldn't make it through into the final segment of qualifying. So, the championship leaders will start the race down in 11th position, much to their disappointment. Alvaro Parent was on it though, the Portuguese driver setting the quickest lap time of anyone, a 45.2, still not uh, managing to get into the 44s yet, and his teammate Gregoire de Moussier will be battling it out for pole position. Peter Cox and Darrell Young looking pretty strong actually this weekend. They haven't really been able to turn their points into prizes, they've only picked up 15 points so far this season despite having some decent pace, but it was Marcus Winkelhock through the final corner who set the fastest lap time in that qualifying session to go quickest of all. And his teammate Mark Basseng will be in the battle for pole position. Another surprise, Fred Makovicki and Steph Dusseldorp unable to make it through to the pole position shootout. Makovicki will start that car this afternoon, 12th position. And so I think that could be quite fun actually to watch during the race. Francesco Castellacci and Enzo Ede, very strong performance from them. Philippe Salacuada had to wrestle his 458 around, just about sticking it into the top eight. And that means Tony Volander will be able to fight for that pole position. And really he has to be he has to be one of the favourites for pole position. But Michael Bartels, as I said earlier, desperately tried, but he and his teammate Yelma Berman will have to start in eleventh position for the qualifying race later on. Let's feel, let's hear how Yama feels about that. Yama, disappointing qualifying session. What's happening with the BMW? Um, I don't know, nothing special, I guess. I mean, uh, we got some extra weight with BOP for, for this weekend, and uh, we've been getting extra weight for the last three weekends. And I think it's just, uh, it's very demanding track, and um, I think uh, it makes a big difference here, the weight of the car, because you go up and down and a lot of turns. So um, we're just, uh, just not quick enough. So hopefully we can uh, improve a bit for the for the race, but I think it will be quite difficult. It make you nervous driving over that blind brow. Yeah, it's quite nice actually. It's uh, there's a lot of different lines, and uh, it's difficult. You don't see the apex, you don't see the braking point, or there's no real brake marker. So uh, it's interesting. Thank you, Yama. So Yama Berman unable to quite get that fantastic-looking BMW Z4 into the final segment of qualifying, even though. They won last time out at the Slovakia ring. It is a very impressive piece of machinery. Nevertheless, another V8 engine, 515 brake horsepower, similar to that of the uh, Mercedes. 
but a little bit less torque than the Mercedes we were looking at earlier and another long car that and the Mercedes the two longest cars in the championship especially when you compare them to the dinky kind of McLarens and that kind of thing which are very very short and nimble the BMW a little bit more difficult Mayor Melnoff discussing with his teammate there and uh, his team boss as well all having a little debrief so the final qualifying session is underway in nine and a half minutes time we will know who will be on pole position for the qualifying race this afternoon the two Mercedes love going out line astern the alinkle.com Munich Motorsports cars Rene Munich was here for the Slovakia ring race last time but he's out rally crossing again this weekend he loves his rally cross does, does Rene Munich that's how the team all started back in uh, 2006 I think it was Munich Motorsports came into existence as a race car team the Sunred Ford GT of Milos Pavlovich another team with a pretty decent record running mainly in the world touring cars running with Seat Leons in the past couple of seasons but they've moved to running this Ford GT and really it's performed pretty strongly for them as I say no points for them so far but they still have got some impressive place and there's a chance Milos Pavlovich could be looking at uh, certainly a Oh, sorry, it's, it's Matteo Cassoni, I should say. But uh, he's going to be looking for a top five position. Ferrari's out line astern as well. So two by two by two. That's what FIA GT1's all about. And they're showing it as for us in this qualifying session. So Enzo Eid and Tony Valanda, the two drivers in those two fantastic looking air, of course, the Ferraris. And then we've only got one Lamborghini. That's going to be driven by Daryl Young, the man from Hong Kong. Canadian born man from Hong Kong across the line then comes Mark Basseng he's going to be the first man to have a go at taking pole position I really think pole position is going to be in the mid 44s we haven't uh, the quickest time we've seen so far today we've been a 44-7 from Basseng's teammate Marcus Vingelhock so I think we're looking at mid 44s for pole position Ooh, big big lift right on the apex there that's quite interesting from uh, from Mark I wonder if he tried to take it flat but then had to lift midway through the corner because if you're going to lift you want to lift before the corner and then power through the corner as opposed to coming off the top of right on the apex especially with a long straight following it's a 33-0 for Basseng already his teammate Nico Pastore has gone two tenths quicker and a 32-2 for Matteo Crisoni so it's, uh, lost a lot of time with that lift did Mark Basseng Crisoni looking like the quickest man out there so far. It's a decent first sector as well, actually, from Matteo Crisoni, the 2004 Italian Formula 3 champion. Now into 11 and 12. Nice wide line in. And you can see the car really bouncing around as it comes through the corners. That's how bumpy... It's through the corners, really. You can see just how bumpy the circuit is. 34.1 in the middle sector. Again, that's beaten by Matteo Crisoni. But uh, I'd imagine Basseng is just warming up for his assault on pole position. Through the final corner we come. Oh, tiny lift, but pretty much flat out as he exits now onto the start finish straight. This is going to be somewhere in the 46s, I would, uh, I would predict. No, 47.3 for Mark Basseng. So not a great lap, but just a sighter. Here comes Matteo Crisoni. This could be a decent effort you know as he runs very very wide on the exit of 16 across the line he comes and it is a 46.1 so not quite as quick in the final sector as perhaps he would have wanted Tony Volander is a man on a mission three tenths quicker than Crisoni in sector one seven tenths quicker than Crisoni in sector two this is definitely going to be a 45 he could be the first man in this pole position shootout to delve into the one minute 44s finished driver Tony Volander for AF Corsa out of the final corner he's had a very strong sectors one and two is this going to be a 44 he dives towards the inside line it's a 44.8 that's a strong contender for pole position Enzo E comes across the line to do a 45.6 and now the Lamborghini of Darrell Young out of the final corner personal best in sectors one and two because this is his first lap he's not going to quite challenged Tony Volander but he's going to do a 47.8 actually so that's a very 
pedestrian opening lap from Darrell Young, perhaps just gently bringing the tyres up the temperature. So currently, Tony Valander is the only one really who has set a representative time. Everyone else is wallowing around in the 47s. We look again at Mark Basseng. How's this uh, sector turning out for him? He's done personal bests in sectors one and two. Not particularly strong sectors as he comes out of the final corner. We've seen the Mercedes is good, though, through the final sector. This should put him into the 45s. It's a 45.6. It puts him third, just a fraction of a tenth of a second behind Enzo Ede in second place. Now here's Gregoire de Moustier. I think he's just completing his outlap, actually. So de Moustier completing his outlap and will then go on to start his first flying lap of the session. Only four minutes to go. So if anyone wants to challenge Volander, they need to get on it, really, because he's currently eight tenths of a second clear of the rest of the field, and the rest of the field at the moment is his teammate. So drivers need to start picking up some pace that's a good first sector for Nicky Pastorelli he has matched pretty much Tony Volander in that first sector Gregoire de Moustier climbing the hill running very very wide on the exit of turn five what's his first sector time going to be like 31.9 is the quickest we've had and it's going to be a 32.7 eight tenths of a second down you can see in that first sector who else have we got out there looking strong? Mark Basseng's middle sector was, wasn't was great. He's going to close in a little bit, I think, on Volander this time around. But this man is possibly one to watch, Nicky Pastorelli. His middle sector has been uh, average, a good first sector, but actually quite a poor middle sector. I lost half a second, but the Mercedes strong through this final sequence of corners. So this could lift Nicky Pastorelli up into second place. If he can hook it all up, through the final corner he comes, over the crest, down, and wow, we saw sparks flying from underneath the car, that was pretty cool. Across the line he comes, can he improve? Basseng doesn't improve, Pastorelli improves to a 45.7. I was expecting a little bit more, I think, from Pastorelli than that. At the moment it's Ferrari, Ferrari, Mercedes, Mercedes, Ford, Lamborghini, Audi. Soon Gregoire de Moustier will set his first actual lap of the session, but with two minutes and ten seconds to go, I would argue that Tony Volander has, uh, has got this one because at the moment no one really seems to be able to match him. Darrell O'Young, decent first sector. Decent-ish middle sector as well, actually, for Darrell O'Young. This could put him right into the mix. This could put him on the... Well, certainly, I think, going to put him on one of the front two rows provisionally whether he can split the Ferraris on the front row we'll find out in uh, about 10 seconds time Peter Cox his teammate watching on in the garage Darrell O'Young will get one more lap out of this but out of the final corner he comes can he move himself onto the front row of the grid or at least the second row it's fifth it's the third row he couldn't quite pull it all together despite some impressive first and second sectors Frank Stippler out of the final corner. He's only done a 49.7 so far. He's improved a little bit, but it's still not going to be spectacular from Stippler. Seventh place. He doesn't move up any positions. Oliver Jarvis looking nonplussed. Car 2 spun and rejoined at turn 14, so Gregoire de Moustier has had a little bit of a, a jaunt out there. But Tony Volanda is back in the pits, and I think he's going to be our man on pole position. Enzo Eads not looking particularly he's in a decent first sector not his personal best though Mark Basseng and Nicky Pastorelli in the Mercedes seem to have backed off they've just come across the line line astern and remain third and fourth there you can see Enzo Ede how is his middle sector he's backed off so it's all over for Enzo Ede the only man out there well, I'm not sure there any, is anyone out there who can usurp Tony Valanda now from that pole position slot just looking at the timing screens Darrell O'Young was out of poor middle sector again and a slightly worse first sector than he had last time around so I don't think Darrell O'Young will be able to move up any positions into the pits comes Enzo Ede as we suspected having backed off in that middle sector 
Checker flag is out. As you can see, the clock has ticked down to zero. Frank Stippler is going to stay out there, keep hacking away at those lap times. He's currently in eighth place. Gregoire de Moustier has put in a decent lap to put himself into seventh position. Frank Stippler out of turn 15, then through 16. Personal best sector one, as you can see. Fairly average sector two. Can he move himself up into seventh, possibly up into sixth? Check and flag falls, and it is seventh place. So he manages to get past the De Moussier McLaren, but it's only seventh place for the Audi. There's Mark Basseng. He's still pushing, actually. He's still pushing. No, he's backed off now, hasn't he? Yes, he, uh, his, first, his, his sectors one and two suggested he was still pushing. He did his personal best in sector two. But uh, I wonder if there was a mistake somewhere in the early parts of sector three. We picked him up at turn 15, so I wonder if he made a mistake at 14 or something like that. Cars 25 and 10, which is Darrell Young and Matteo Cressoni, are both under investigation for track limits, so we may well hear about their best lap times being deleted by the end of this session, potentially. I don't know, the stewards will be looking at the CCTV footage of each particular corner, taking reports from the marshals to uh, hear what they said. But into Park Ferme come the cars then. Tony Valanda and Enzo Ede qualifying first and second for this final qualifying segment. And that means it's going to be an AF Corsa front row. It's going to be those two men, in fact, who will start on the front row later this afternoon. Philippe Salaquadra on the right. Francesco Castellacci on the left. And <laughs> Castellacci and E looking absolutely delighted with that. And here, I'm here. I think, uh, well, I think we can, we can hear Hayley Coxon is uh, almost getting ready. You can just hear her trying to line up these two drivers. Let's hear from Enzo Eid. Hayley's down there. And so front row start for the team. What a start to the weekend. Yes, really nice. First time this week, uh, uh, this season, we have some luck, the weather and the car. So um, for me also, for my personal performance, I'm really happy. It's one of my best results in qualifying so life and my racing career. So really happy for this. Both of the Ferraris have certainly been yes. on the pace here this weekend. Yeah, I hope we will do now a good race. Uh, and let's hope we can end up in the same result like in qualifying. And are you enjoying this track? Yeah, I really love this track. Uh, I, lo I won last year here also in GT3, so I like the track. Thank you, Enzo. Ah, yep, yeah, Enzo Eid, who ah, won with the Mercedes last year here in FIA GT3. Ferraris ah. this season. Uh, Audi last year, I should say, sorry, for, uh, for WRT. And now moving to the Ferrari, he's got his best qualifying performance of the season so far. So this is, uh, this is what happened to Gregoire de Moustier then. Through the left-hander, and oh, it's going, it's going, it's gone. It's a big old moment there for de Moustier. That was coming out of turn 13 and into 14, so... That's a would have been going fairly quick there, you have to say. So that was a uh, big old moment for de Moustier. He managed to get it all together and do a 46.455. He will line up in eighth position on the grid as out goes the course car then to inspect the circuit after that qualifying session. Mercedes-Benz supplying GT1 with their course cars for the championship. Here's how the grid will look. Ferrari, Ferrari on the front row of the grid. Then the two Mercedes in second and third position. Tony Valanda absolutely on it. Look at that. Nine tenths of a second clear of the rest of the field. An absolutely stunning drive from here. Mark Basseng and Nicky Pastorelli, third and fourth. Then the first of the Lamborghinis. Peter Cox will start the car. The, champ the qualifying race later on today will be started by the second drivers you see here in the list. Milos Pavlovic will start the Ford GT. We saw him getting pretty feisty at the start of the qualifying race in Navarra. He'll be hoping to make another decent start. Jarvis and Parent completing the top eight. So Ferrari dominant here in the qualifying session, taking pole position. Tony Valanda took pole position in the opening race of the season. He's done it again here. Tony, congratulations. Was that an easy process for you? Uh, yes and no. I mean, we've been working the whole season, never stopped working and, and trying to improve. And uh, maybe together with the car, my driving, 
I, of course, had teamwork and Ferrari together, so we've been quite consistent the whole weekend. I did 44.4 in the practice, 44.9 in the Q1, and 44.7 in the Q3, so the car is quite consistent on one lap. Uh, we need to see now in the race. Uh, so far, uh, the race has not always been our strongest point, so hopefully we can have a consistent race car. Have the Ferrari been uh, struggling with the tyres so far this season? Yeah, I mean, that's the the drop we have after a few laps and uh, early stages of the race. We are maybe even quicker than leaders or, or, or cars around us. Then there's a point we go the same and in the end of the in the end of the stint we are struggling. So this is a demanding track also for the tyres. So if we are OK here, we should be OK for the rest of the season. But let's have first the race and then, then the comments. What's the reason for Ferrari putting so much pressure on the tyres? Uh, I, mean, I mean, you need to talk with the engineers. I think um, this, uh, let's say, GT3 car format, you need to homologate uh, the car. Uh, we probably would have some new ideas, uh, but our hands, are, we cannot touch the car for this season. So uh, maybe, maybe a few things in the car that would help us to go even quicker and maybe more consistent. Thank you. So, Tony Valanda, pole position, and now being sent off to the press conference, which, uh, which uh, for the members of the press that are here this weekend at the Portimao circuit. So, that has set the grid for the qualifying race, which will be coming up this afternoon, and you can see it live on the GT1 World website, as well as various other uh, TV channels. Check your local guide for, for, for full details. So. That will be getting underway at uh, one o'clock local time. So here's how the driver's standings look going into the qualifying race later on today. No points for qualifying, but the qualifying race will give the winner eight points. Michael Bartels and Yelma Berman will start the race in 11th place. Second place, Steph Dusseldorf and Fred Makovicki will start the race in 12th place. So this really is a bit of an open goal for Mark Basseng and Marcus Winkelhock perhaps this weekend because the Mercedes have shown decent pace. This could see them move to the top of the Drivers' Championship by saying, saying that the focus really for Al Inkle is the team's championship. But if he can be in the battle for both, I'm sure he'll be absolutely delighted with that. Stefano Telly and Lawrence Vanthor, you could see, still struggling. There is Al Inkle at the top of the championship. Hexis Racing, second place. Only a point ahead of WRT. And that's going to be an interesting battle between them. At the moment, it's WRT who had the edge in that qualifying session with Frank Stippler out qualifying Gregoire de Moustier just. Darrell O'Young has qualified his Lamborghini fifth place on the grid. Darrell, through to Q3, fifth fastest. Were you happy with that? Uh, no, no, not, you know, a bit disappointed, actually, because even my Q3 time with the more fuel in the car was uh, quicker. But, uh, yeah, just, just the car changed a bit throughout the session when the fuel came down. Um, I was struggling a bit with oversteer, uh, quite a bit, and it was it was a bit difficult for me in that session. So uh, yeah, that, that really led us to not you know not not be able to get a good time, and we made some adjustments between the sessions, try to improve the car, but uh, wasn't wasn't today. So uh, unfortunately, we couldn't get the get a better position, but it was really close to get a second. Uh, Tony was a little bit further ahead, uh, but you know, and I think the car is, is cars quick, and we'll see what we can do for the race. Thank you. So Daryl will be taking over that car after Peter Cox has started it in the one hour long qualifying race that will come up later today as I said and yeah I, I said during his lap that he's going to be hoping can he you know make front row or possibly the second row and then to end up in fifth place was a bit of a disappointment for him in his Lamborghini Gallardo which, which drives like a go-kart to all intents and purposes from what I'm told the drivers get in it and it, it feels like they're going back to their karting days it's got such a low center of gravity with a uh, 90 degree V10 engine 535 brake horsepower as well and it's uh, pretty similar specs to, to some of the other cars apart from that v10 engine that you can see but it is a lot lower than some of the other cars and a lot more central and lower weight distribution which really helps the car around circuits like this well an entertaining qualifying session it's going to be a ferrari lockout on the front row of the grid it's coming up later on today at half past one local time the drivers and the marshals, sorry, fixing the AstroTurf. But join us for the qualifying race later on this afternoon. The GT1 World Championship here in Portimao.